right, which the country decides that there is a public health exigency, um, the access is facilitated uh, by licensing the medication compulsory. Thank you. Would anybody else on the panel like to comment on that? Mr. Shah. Cancer has become an acute problem in India. It's a disease next only to heart disease with the number of deaths. It's not issue of allocation of R&D costs. And in our written submission, we will bring this out. Where, when this compulsory license was granted, was supplying only to 200 patients. Out of a population of 15,000 who needed this medicine. It was only for access to this medicine that the government of India very reluctantly granted this license. What we are overlooking is that there were two more applications for compulsory license, both of which have been rejected. So out of three applications, one is granted, two are rejected. And most of the submissions which have been written submissions which have been made are based on motivated media reports where some health activists have at some point of some time said that uh, government should grant compulsory license and for government use uh, for some drugs. Now, government has not yet uh, taken a view on this uh, and verified that this is being reported for more than one things. <coughs> shows that how government is reluctant even to consider other compulsory licenses. So it is not <coughs> merely allocation of R&D cost, but when people are dying of cancer, there is a medication available. And just because they cannot afford that medication, should they die? The point on the R&D allocation cost, which I said earlier a little differently, US, Western Europe, and Japan contributes 82% sales of the pharmaceutical industry, global sales, where only 18% of the world population lives. 82% of the population, population lives in other parts of the world, including India and they contribute only 12% of the sales. Now, isn't R&D cost recovered from the 88% sales? I am not denying, please do not misunderstand me, that rest of the world should not contribute to innovation. They should. Question is, in what proportion? Please. You know, I, I just want to uh, uh, stress that last point and, and you know, my view is not important in this, uh, but I, I would draw your attention to the fact that when the compulsory license was actually uh, first adjudicated first by the Patent Office and then the appellate body, the ruling uh, f made at the lower levels recommended a license at the highest end of the range recommended by the World Health Organization. Keeping in mind the requirement that you just articulated that you know that you have to uh, contribute to some share of the global fixed cost, and then in the appellate uh, review they increased that remuneration even further uh, to take into account exactly that fact. So I think the Indian system is aware that you have to balance the access concern, but not oblivious to what is the fair share of of, of contributing to global R and D. Please. Um, I, I just want to remind, you know, when we talk about cancer drugs and the number of people affected in India, uh, in the United States we talked about compulsory licensing in 2001 when 20 people were affected with anthrax and there was a fear that more people would be affected. So the, what count, amounts to public health and at what stage it amounts to public health exigencies, these are all questions that, uh, that internationally the sovereign has the right to decide. And, and in this case I think it's well documented that India took uh, a recent sort of opinion in, in a showing the uh, license. Thank you. Now turning to the rest of the panel, um, is there a tension between characterizing India as a free rider in the area of IP protection and finding that India is hurting itself 
with respect to uh, innovation and investment uh, by means of its IP policies. Uh, I see, uh, Mr. Popper, you might want to answer that. Sure. I mean, in, in much of the discussion, I think it's been a little bit of a debate about the sort of wisdom of, of IP policies and where the balance is. I, I, I come from the, the side that, that believes that patent protection and limited monopolies lead to innovation and investment. That, that's my world view. I understand others may, may have a different view. So I, I think that, uh, yes, I, I believe when India has a, a restrictive policy or policies that promote its domestic manufacturers or domestic um, uh, interests over those of perhaps more economically efficient outside interests, I think that that does shoot themselves in the foot, perhaps not in the short run, but I think undoubtedly in the long run. And I'm not an economist, but I look at you know 400 years of anecdotal evidence that tells me that more open economies tend to do better over the long run than, than closed economies. Mr. Shaw, please. Apparently, there seems to be a dichotomy between the U.S. government position and the U.S. business. The U.S. has been a signatory to the TRIPS Agreement and Doha Declaration on Public Health, and which allowed, which set the minimum standards of IP, which developing countries are obliged <coughs> to adhere to. India has met those standards. And between 2005 and 2013, it is corroborated by the fact that not one government has been taken India to dispute settlement body for not complying with the trip settlement. Now what US business and industry is asking is that India must comply with the US standards of IP protection. I worked with Pfizer for 30 years and I was driving Pfizer's IP agenda in India. I'm fully familiar with Pfizer's position. <laughs> and I had at that point of time, I'm going back to read back in 1992, said that do not expect that India would have overnight the same IP standards as you have. You need to be hand-holding and move the country closer. And one reference was made to music and copyright industry. Why in copyright industry, the enforcement and IP protection move faster than pharmaceutical? I would urge US business to consider this. Local industry demanded a greater protection. In pharmaceutical, that time will come now when the local industry will start demanding more of IP protection. Let me just uh, uh, shift over to Professor Flynn for one last comment. Uh, would you agree uh, with the notion that there's a tension between the long-run impact uh, on India and the short-run impact of uh, the uh, IP policies that we're talking about? Well, long, I know that it's necessarily um, a tension. You know, that I think you, the first way you framed the question, uh, you, do, you do point out a specific tension that I think, you know, the same policy can't be hurting, uh, you know, foreign U.S. Uh, businesses at the same time. It's not helping Indian businesses. There is there is a contradiction there when we argue that you know this policy both at the same time is hurting us and is hurting you. And that's kind of where I started out my my testimony is that the reason we have that contradiction in the testimony is a legal reason. You're you're both trying to meet the requirements of Special 301 and trying to meet the requirements of the EC tariff decision at WTO in this forum that is not capacitated to address those issues. But but that is what this is about. That's what the that's what the economic uh, analysis coming out, of the, coming out of the background is. Um, I would just state one more, one more point uh, because I have to leave, and that's that you know the, com the complaints on the compulsory licensing, most of them focus around this local working requirement interpreted as a um, local manufacturing requirement. And I just encourage you to, to read the opinion itself, and especially paragraph 52 of the, of the APAB opinion, 
where it expressly states that that is not their interpretation. It, it says at once that there may be instances when uh, a monop monop monopolization with no man local manufacturing would violate the patent law, but it states that this is not that case, that it took a holistic determination and that the pricing of the issue was the main factor. And that does come back to your first question, which is compulsory licensing is absolutely the means within the TRIPS agreement that, en that enables developing countries to calibrate access with a reasonable position <coughs> towards innovation through the research and development. And as, uh, as Dr. Uh, Subramanian or, or Mr. <laughs> Um, uh, stated that's the million dollar question and there is no uh, WTO uh, jurisprudence stating how you make that determination and the best we have is UNDP and WHO guidelines um, and, and as was stated that the royalties are actually at the high end of those guidelines so you know I think if you're going to do anything which I don't think you are you should applaud that decision <laughs> because it actually moves India um, I think part of the uh, submission that we made is you have to look at how far India has come. And the way globally we balance that is the TRIPS agreement. India is fully in compliance with the TRIPS agreement. It's also attempting to use the undefined terms and the flexibilities in that agreement for its own purposes. That is fully permitted to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Johansson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this is a question uh, for Mr. Subramanian. You had spoken on India Science to earlier, and I believe you described your operations in India as a model for other pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies. Could you maybe ex explain what, what they are doing in India and how you see that as being uh, a preferred you know, means of operating in, in, in India? Thank you. I should probably uh, leave this question to Dr. Shah to answer. Uh, uh, he probably knows more than I do. Uh, but, but the reason I think it, it's a possible model is because, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, Jilid has, has two, uh, 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 two experiences in India. One is uh, to uh, sell, sell a branded uh, patented product uh, at, at much lower cost. So it's, it's an example of tiered pricing, uh, you know, to, uh, 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 higher prices in rich countries, lower prices in poor countries, and that's for a branded patented product. Uh, so that's one example. And the other example is where it's licensing its, its technology to many Indian companies so that actually it forces the competition that's going to bring down prices. So, so in, in a sense, what it's trying to you know, put in, in, into practice is developing a model where you remunerate the innovator uh, at some reasonable rate, while at the same time ensuring that the access uh, objective is met in kind of creative, creative ways. Um, so, so that's why it's a possible, uh, you know, and it's non-confrontational. Uh, the atmospherics seem to be very good. It's an American firm, so that's, that's even better. Uh, and, and I think that's probably uh, worth studying in the future. Yes. Gilead entered into a voluntary license with 11 Indian companies to manufacture and supply this product. We did also offer technology for that. Well, the conditions of that license may not pass the scrutiny of uh, FTC here in the USA, or Competition Commission in India. But it was an attempt. Roche is doing exactly the same is uh, working with uh, other domestic Indian companies, offering technology and tiered pricing, so that uh, the excess issue is addressed and it takes care of, there is no parallel imports out of India of the lower price product of road. So, as I mentioned earlier, number of these companies are collaborating and cooperating with Indian companies to explore the Indian market. And <coughs> one last statement. Mark, CEO on the CNBC interview just two weeks ago, stated that Mark is growing in India at more than twice the average market rate of growth. Now, if this is the experience of uh, 
American pharmaceutical companies that yes, they are uh, growing their sales. Uh, we really fail to understand that how does it uh, adversely impact their interest in India. And most of most products which are sold in India, are, which is driving their growth, are patented products and imported into India. There is no local manufacture of these products. All right, thank you for your response. Um, Mr. Schlesinger, you, you wrote in, in your written statement that, that the Indian government has been urged to issue a directive or strict policy guidelines mandating that all government departments across the country use legal software. Do you know what extent uh, illegal software is being used by government entities in India? Do you have any ideas to what, what that number would be? Uh, well, you know, looking at the benchmark, which would be the overall and license use of software, we're looking at about six out of ten copies in um, the Indian economy as a whole. Um, to our understanding, there is use of software in public as well as in private enterprise. Um, I have no specific information to indicate to me either way that, that the number is either higher or lower than the overall rate of software piracy. Um, I will endeavor to provide uh, the Commission with some more specific information about public use. Um, but, you know, what we do know is that when governments do take s specific steps to lower the, the levels of piracy or reduce hopefully <coughs> to zero, the amount of unlicensed use of software in their government agencies, it sets a very, very important example for um, both state, any state-owned enterprises, but also in the private sector to do the same. And it, it, with other countries under the United the U.S. government has taken has been quite vocal on on in, in instances in which those countries are using uh, software illegally on government government entities are using U.S. software illegally. To what extent has the U.S. government made this a priority? I simply don't know the answer. I was wondering if maybe you knew what what that would be. Well, uh, certainly on the U.S. side, from the domestic side, we have an executive order. Um, addressing the issue and so it's implemented here domestically in foreign countries um, specifically with regard to India do you know if the US has, has made this a high priority? Oh, um, well I would say that it is on the US's priority it's, uh, it's on the US's list <laughs> of issues um, that it mentions when it talks about intellectual property practices in India um, I, I couldn't give you an idea um, from my vantage point as to the level of priority that the U.S. currently, um, you know, gives to this issue. Yes, Mr. Rao. Uh, I'd like to comment on that. The real concern that we have today is uh, not so much government <coughs> agencies buying pirated software, but government and corporate employees loading pirated software on government or corporate machines that they have access to. In other words, it is individual malfeasance on the part of the employees. And that is what we're trying to address. I don't think any Indian government department is, uh, you know, deliberately uh, putting pirated software. The question is, are we policing enough to make sure that employees are not misusing their privileged access to a computer or to a database. And that is why I think the suggestion of making it taxable and letting the tax man lose is quite an ingenious one because the tax people generally have an ability to get in where the anti-piracy police may not be that effective. So I thought that was a very clever idea. All right, thank you for your responses. Uh, and also, Mr. Schlesinger, you mentioned it, it page four of your written statement that the policy <coughs> act, when it was amended in 2012, uh, had some positive features added to it. Could you, add, could you explain what some of those positive features are and how well they work? Um, sure. Uh, well, you know, the, the Indian copyright law has been amended several times over the, um, over the last, uh, I guess, 20 years or so. The, the latest one um, being in, t in 2012. Um, one, of the, one of the major issues at play in India um, was the affording of uh, full rights for music 
musical compositions, and um, this is one area where we do, did see a uh, improvement uh, in the Indian copyright law statute as amended. Um, I think it's just fair to note that in addition to that, um, the, the overall enforcement structure, uh, which provides for um, various civil remedies such as Anton Puller orders and um, Moravia injunctions is, is, and John Doe actions are, is left in, in place. So there is, there is an underlying structure for strong um, copyright protection. Of course, it's the matters that have been left out that we're most concerned about, including um, dealing with the unauthorized camcording of movies right off the screen. There were 43 instances of major U.S. motion <coughs> pictures which were stolen right off the screen and then, you know, in very short order, um, transmitted over the internet and made available to, to millions, harming that market. And um, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting is now considering a provision to improve the law in this area, and we're very hopeful that the Indian government can do that as it will have a, a positive ameliorative effect. Thank you for your response, and my time is going to expire right now, so I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Broadman. Thank you. Um, I'm glad Mr. Ezel could move up and be a little bit closer. You were pretty far back and on the third row there. I have a hard time seeing. Um, my questions relate to uh, the ICT sector right now. Um, it's so successful in India. What is the resistance to having any involvement in the ITA2 negotiations? What reasons are the Indians giving you uh, for why they aren't, you think they'd be a leader in this negotiation? And then maybe Mr. Rob could comment too. I think the dialogue on the ground in India perceives that uh, India was not benefited by the original information technology agreement uh, because uh, they perceive a decline in their ICT production, hardware production sector, and they attribute that to the information technology agreement. Whereas I think that's a misguided analysis. And certainly competition from China had a part in eroding India's ICT production industry, uh, partly because Chinese firms used uh, unfair innovation work practices themselves. That's where part of the fault lies. But one of the real reasons why India did not benefit as much as it could have from the ITA was that it maintained throughout the entire period of the ITA's implementation an inverted duty structure in which what the ITA did was reduce tariffs for finished ICT products, but it didn't cover as many of the inputs, the components uh, that go into ICT products. Those weren't addressed very often in the original ITA. India left their tariffs high. So what happened is that uh, it, it couldn't uh, have a, a, a competitive uh, assembly industry, and it ended up just importing these parts. And that's actually what the IT2 is designed to address. Um, I think when you look at the data globally, you see countries like Argentina and Brazil that have not participated in the ITA. They've seen their participa participation in global ICT value chains decline by as much as 60%. Um, so I think why, well, while that sector may not have performed as well as India would have liked, uh, it's not because of the ITA, it's because of problems that manufacturers face, infrastructure, uh, the, the energy access. There are a number of reasons why that sector has not performed as well as it could have. Um, and I think that's important to understand. I think the ITA has been a boom to the ICT services industry in India by ensuring that they can have access to affordable best of breed ICT products and that has been instrumental in helping them uh, develop a very vibrant sector. And joining the ITA to expansion would be in India's best interest. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rabin, do you have a I think on? right from the beginning we've, we faced this tension. Um, do we benefit by uh, developing our own software products under high tariff walls, or are we better off just importing best-in-class software products and then further customizing, further growing off of them. And we chose the second uh, 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 route, and I think that's proved successful on the software and services side. The hardware problem goes back to what Mr. Subramanian was saying. There is a very, very serious debate going on right now in India as to why we have failed 
as a manufacturing country and why we are regressing with the sole exception of auto and auto ancillaries in virtually every other manufacturing. Not only have we lost share to China, but we're actually regressing. The percentage, I mean, we, I think last three, four quarters, we've had even negative growth in manufacturing. So this is part of a bigger debate, and it keeps coming up again and again, and simply doesn't go away. What are we doing right, or what are we doing wrong? And, and as part of that, we have different uh, lobbies saying hey, we should participate in IDA or we shouldn't. But in general, the software and services industry has benefited from openness, and I think the hardware want to win eventually. But right now, this has become part of a bigger manufacturing debate. Uh, sorry, and that's why the, LC, the, the PMA uh, and not participating in the ITA2 uh, are manifestations of the same underlying big debate that's, go that's going on. Okay. Um, I wanted to, to touch a bit on the, the local testing of ICT equipment issue. Um, do you expect this issue to, to reemerge uh, next year? Um, and uh, what will the, um, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get at what do you expect on this issue coming up? Um, were, were, we, were we talking originally, um, the proposal first came out of using ISO standards, uh, can you talk to me a little bit about uh, how the dom domestic debate went on that? I think Mr. Ezel, this is, might be for you and then anybody else that wanted to. Well, I think what we saw with Indian policy here was a change from the previously established policy. Previously, uh, Indian laboratories would accept the results of internationally accredited laboratories um, wouldn't qualify in ICT equipment and they changed that so that the testing had to occur within India approved laboratories. I think the optimal outcome would be for India to revert to the policy that was in place before that worked effectively of accepting the results of decisions rendered by internationally accredited laboratories. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at the end of October, India announced a three-month delay in the implementation of these policies. Uh, that three months came up here at the start of the year, and they put policies back in place. Um, so unless something changes, uh, we may have to uh, face this going forward. And I think uh, when you look at what's happened to ICT industries, uh, it's very real that they have faced I mean, up to hundreds of million dollars uh, in lost sales. Uh, for uh, their products uh, because of approval delays, regulatory delays, um, and this continues to be a very serious issue for the global ICT industry. It would seem there would be a domestic constituency to get something working here. Is there, does anyone know? Uh, 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 perhaps I'm not answering, uh, may not answer your question directly, but I, I think here, you know, let, let's, be, let's be honest and, you know, the problem here is China. I, I think the big issue with in, uh, you know, in-country certification and testing of telecom products has to do with the security concern about China. And I think, uh, the, uh, the, the, I think the honest answer is that the Indian government is just muddling its way through. Uh, you know, it, it wants to do something about Chinese equipment, uh, uh, but you know, uh, it's kind of sight everyone's getting sideswiped in the process, uh, as is domestic uh, industry. So. Uh, I think um, going forward, uh, uh, the Department of Telecommunications and, and, and the security people have to get together and see how they can be more smart and efficient about addressing, you know, genuine concerns about uh, uh, Chinese security without, you know, sideswiping other suppliers and other domestic producers. So I think it, it's just a work in progress. Because you think, I'm not a specialist in this, but you think that a mutual recognition agreement would be able to smooth things out between the two countries and, and you, deal with your China problem. Exactly. And, and I think uh, this is, you know, uh, this is part of what we would uh, do in an FTA, for example, that, you know, this is not an American, this is not directed at the U.S., it's, it's at someone else. So there should be possibilities of having, uh, you know, bilateral arrangements whereby <coughs> you spare countries that you don't, you don't have fears uh, against and, 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 and you focus your concerns. So I think it's eminently uh, right for bilateral FTA type dealings. Right, I agree. Yes, Mr. Rana. Yeah, I'd like to uh, second that. 
That is the big elephant in the middle of the room, particularly vis-a-vis -vis telecom. Every day there's 